Our guest today, Kevin Meyer, he is the D-Day Museum coordinator. And the D-Day Museum, if you don't know where it is, and you should, it is at, uh, well, it's on Lake Road. If you take uh, Broad Street, it's a block over a block east of Broad Street on Lake Road. So tell me about the museum a little bit for people that may not know. The museum was opened in 2016. Uh, a couple years prior to that, the building was given to us by the First Magar uh, Hungarian Orthodox Church. Um, the typical $1 donated the building for a museum to D-Day, Ohio. Took a couple years. Uh, they continued having services in the building. When they no longer had services, we opened the museum. So that's where the D-Day in the name comes from. We hope to expand our our displays of D-Day, but D-Day refers to our affiliation with D-Day Ohio that puts on the D-Day Conneaut event every August for the last 20 years at uh, Conneaut Township Park. Well, I can remember being in here a few years ago when the, when the pews were still here and there's a pipe organ. And I mean, there's been huge differences since then. I mean, you've got a 1940s kitchen. It's not just D-Day, but it's kind of wartime altogether. I mean, um, that, that you have here. Exactly. What uh, what we've done if, with the artifacts on display, everything has been donated. So the donations drive what's in the museum. And it became fairly obvious rather quickly as, as we started putting things together that the real mission, if you will, of the museum is to tell the story of those men, women, and children from this area that lived through that experience and all in experience that it took to win World War II. So we've, we've, we've uh, expanded our home front display, a typical home front, mm -hmm. what the experience was like in Conneaut in 19, roughly 1944. And we're sitting in a 1940s kitchen right now. And from what I understand, the refrigerator that's in back of you right now is still a working refrigerator, or at least it was. It was in somebody's apartment up until a couple of years ago. It was up until last summer. It was uh, it was right here in Conneaut being used. It's a 1936 General Electric, one of the first models that did not have the condenser on top, the monitor top. Um, it's one of the highlights of our kitchen along with the 1929 stove that we have. Um, typical gas stove it is a it is portraying a working kitchen we took the kitchen the typical basement church kitchen that we're all familiar with and mm -hmm. from our communities uh, wanted to decide what you know in part of the discussion on what do we do with it do you tear it out do we block it off do we make it a, a docent area only type thing and the the discussion led to let's restore it to a 1940 kitchen and that's what we've done you also have things like uh, tea sets from the time and uh, rationing books and cookbooks on how to cook with less, that sort of thing. Right. It's uh, it's set up very, very similar to what we would have expected to see walking into one of the congregants from this church, possibly mm -hmm. a Hungarian immigrant, uh, actually a Hungarian immigrant because of this church into what their kitchen would have looked like. So we they're sitting at the table. We're depicting that the the wife is literally sitting at the table with her ration books, with her cookbooks, and with her shopping list of what can she use with the rationed goods and what she has in, in the cupboard, in the pantry, what may be uh, able to harvest in the garden, mm -hmm. and put together the meal for that week. The uh, We have a, a an original paprika, dispenser from Hungary that was donated to us by Reverend Szilagyi that belonged to his family. He, he just died recently. Just recently passed yeah. away. Uh, donated that and the egg holder that you see on the table here. Yeah. Uh, and a couple, I've and seen a them in movies. Other, <laughs> and a couple other little kitschy things that, yeah. were, that came with them when, when he fled the, shortly after World War II, fled the communist invasion of Hungary. Um, and since this was the Hungarian church and with his connection to the community showing what the community was like, we added those to give it the kind of the Hungarian flavor here in the kitchen. Right. And the, the uh, stove is really interesting. It's a beautiful stove, uh, gas stove from the time. I also noticed you have a civil defense helmet up there. We have a civil defense helmet showing that the man of the house would have been involved with this, the home front civil defense. 
He is, there is a gas mask, a Civil Defense issued gas mask hanging below it. And then what we're doing with the rest of the display coming out of the kitchen, we're slowly as, as we gather more materials and, and more 1940s appropriate items to display furniture wise. We have a Hoosier cupboard, we have a radio stand, a, a desk, a dining room table. We're slowly expanding into showing the, how the, the war involved every aspect of the home. And not only what was going on in the kitchen, but sitting around the radio, listening mm -hmm. to the only source of news, the pantry with what was sparsely stocked with items that were available based on what was rationed, some kids' games on the dining room table, and then a large selection of home front ephemera throughout the, this area donated to us by Geneva Public Library. And this year we have a new display. We have a, a late 1930s domestic sewing machine made up in Cleveland. And it's set up showing a, mm -hmm. a making uh, garments out of feed sacks. There's a feed sack set up on the sewing machine. Oh, yeah. And uh, something we've all heard about and what I found most interesting is the color of the feed sack. It is a very vibrant colored feed sack and the pictures we see from that area they're yeah. make, they're making smocks and aprons and all sorts of things out of them and they're just the black and white and you just picture a subdued color and it's it was not they're a very colorful well, from what i heard during the depression is that the people that made the feed sacks found out that people were undoing them and using them as materials to make dresses and stuff so when they heard that they decided to make their feed sacks more colorful so they would make nice looking so clothing better <laughs> clothing and better sales that's right the package sold, sold the product in uh, to a great extent i don't think people would put up with that today i'm not so sure yeah <laughs> i don't know if if if, if i'm not if if it came into the depression, the war area, I'm not sure the home front. I don't know how we would yeah. survive as a as a nation anymore. Yeah. But then it's the, it was what had to be done. Exactly. There was no, there was no alternative. Right. And the the museum here also. Uh, a lot of times you have like barricades and you can see the kitchen, but you can't. There's a rope or something you can't cross. But here you can really go up and look at things. And when I mean, we're sitting in the, the kitchen area right now, and a lot of it is is pretty accessible. It is. We encourage gentle touching. Uh, th these items were given to us by the families. They've been stored. We realize that they, in some cases, have great value. But on the other hand, in a small community like this, it does give us the ability to have more of a hands-on community. Uh, gentle touching. If somebody's mm -hmm. not touching the docents right there, we can control it. Uh, that's something you don't have the ability to do in a large museum right. with thousands of people coming through. Everything has to be behind glass. Right. But even just not touching, but you can walk around, you can look at the stove and what it looks like then and oh, yeah. probably look, open up the oven and see what, uh, you know, could you make today's turkey in there <laughs> and, and that sort of thing? I don't know how well our... <laughs> Yeah, that that looks Absolutely. pretty small. We can we can reach right over and open up, and that was this is a large size stove for that era, and it would be what maybe a what, what we Half. consider a medium size. Yeah, bird. it's 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 <laughs> maybe a ten pound yeah. bird. <laughs> so tell us up, up. We're downstairs. Tell us upstairs some of the highlights, some of the the displays. Uh, upstairs, we have several families have, have entrusted us with with memorabilia from. Uh, from their loved ones. Some of the, the highlights up there with D-Day, the 75th anniversary of D-Day is tomorrow. We're actually mm -hmm. uh, sitting here on June 5th. Um, we have an original relic from the Normandy invasion that was dug up on, on Omaha Beach a few years back, which is a um, the gas masks that the soldiers carried coming ashore. They actually carried gas masks with them. They were in a rubberized pouch it is a rubberized pouch that had been buried oh. for about 65 Jeez. years and then was dug up. We have it setting near what a modern reproduction of that pouch would have looked like to show the contrast. Um, we have quite a large selection of Army Air Corps things. The highlight of what I think we have is the Walter Getze diary. Uh, Sergeant Getze joined the Army Air Corps. He was scheduled to fly 25 missions. He kept a mission log that he had numbered ahead one through 25. The log ends after the 15th mission as Sergeant Getze was shot down. He and his, the B-17 that he was a, a, a radio operator on, um, he was taken prisoner of war and later died as a, as a prisoner at German hands. Um, we have the original diary. We've transcribed it. People can, people can look at the original diary. They can 
read mm -hmm. the entries in the diary, go through. Uh, that's just one of many, many items that we have. You have, well, just as part of the decor, I guess, you've got Life Magazine's 10 cents with Lauren Bacall on them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating time, the 40s, I think. Uh, and I enjoy movies and all from that, that period. It is. And, uh, and that's one of the things we have sitting areas. We have a large selection of the time of, of Life magazines, of Yank magazines, and especially of local newspapers, the News Herald, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Star Beacon, Jefferson, uh, the Gazette, uh, and so, as well as Erie and, and Cleveland papers of the highlights of the war that are all in protective sheets. They can be handled. They can be read. We encourage people to have a seat, take a look through. We've got several scrapbooks of families they've given us um, that they kept as children or of their loved ones' service that are available to look at. Um, just uh, trying to be a, a welcoming, comforting, come in, have mm -hmm. a seat, take a look around, read up on it, experience what it really was like. Um, one of the highlights here in Conneaut is probably the fact that Mildred Geller was from Conneaut, graduated from Conneaut High School. Her father was a dentist here in town. Um, we have a, a small bio on her written up, but she gained her notoriety by becoming Axis Sally. Uh, and she was over in Germany telling the American soldiers to give up. They're going to, they're sweethearts or have other guys and uh, just trying to demoralize. Exactly. And she ended up in prison for it. She did. Enemy, you know, propaganda was, was as big and and fake news if you want to call it was as big back then as it is yeah. now I mean, that's the original and fake news <laughs> exactly and uh and and it, it, it you kind of are, are taken aback when you realize just how things are and and how things used to be and and with uh mm. you know something like mildred geller coming from conneaut and then finding herself in a situation living moving to germany in the 30s being there being in that group in that situation and having to make the decision, what did she do? And she chose to what we consider be a traitor to mm -hmm. her country and attempt to demoralize and very effectively in some cases demoralize yeah. the troops. Now, if somebody's listening to this and they want, they have something they'd like to donate, you know, the, the baby from the forties from their parent, parents or grandparents or great grandparents, how would they do that? They can get hold of us here at the museum. Uh, DD Ohio does have a website if you're online. Uh, otherwise, we're open Saturday or Sunday. They can stop in anytime when we're open. The docents are here and are available, or they can contact me directly at 440-224-0717. Uh, okay. Um, we've only got a little bit of time left. I just wanted to, to mention, I've mentioned this before, but how nice it is. You're open more than just Saturday and Sunday during D-Day weekend, right? Right. We have extended hours on Thursday. D-Day officially opens at noon on Thursday. Uh, I believe that's August 15th. I should know that. Um, and the museum will open at 10 o'clock and be open until 7 o'clock that Thursday, that Friday, and that Saturday. So we're opening Thursday and Friday, and then we're opening earlier and later on, fri on Saturday during the event. It's for families. This is something that people... Coming off the freeway, they could find a place to park. They could be shuttled to D-Day. They could be shuttled here, shuttled from here back to D-Day. And it doesn't cost them anything. They can donate, and that's good. But, you know, someplace else, this could be like 20 bucks here, 50 bucks 50 there. Bucks ahead, yeah. 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 So the, free, the free Higgins boat rides. There's yes, yes. Down there. we are, and I will mention that over the 4th of July weekend on Friday. And Friday we're open, but there will be free Higgins boat rides down at Public Dock during the 4th of July festival for anybody that's coming into town for that event as well. Yeah, I've done, I've done that a few times, and they will not take donations. No, so, no. no, no uh, we are not permitted to take donations yeah. there. So uh, stop by the museum. The museum's open right. uh, on your way to or from. And, uh, and but it's open until Memorial Day, noon to 5, every Saturday every and Saturday. Sunday, and then expanded hours during the D-Day weekend. Right. Kevin Meyer, thank you, the D-Day Museum coordinator. Thanks for being right. here. Thank you, Bob.